السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيد خلق الله أجمعين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن سار على سبيله ونهجه واستنى بسنته واهتدى بهده لا يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد إمام مسلم رحمه الله تعالى نريد سن الصحيح on the authority of Umar radiallahu an, a very famous and long hadith, which is known as the famous hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam. And it's the hadith and the narration that I'm sure all of you are familiar with, in which Jibreel alayhi salam came to our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the form of a man. And he came and he sat with him and he asked him a number of questions concerning Islam, concerning Iman, concerning Ihsan, and some other issues as well. And the Prophet ﷺ responded to these issues. And this hadith, because of how comprehensive it is, and because of the information that is given within this single narration of our Prophet ﷺ, this hadith is considered to be from uh, the principles of our religion, one of the foundations of our deen. You can gain more or less everything you need to know about your aqidah about your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about the creed and methodology that me and you should have as Muslims from this single hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam. And if you were to take this single hadith and to drill down into it in detail, and every single point you go and elaborate into it, you would find that it would take weeks upon weeks uh, for you to finish going through this hadith in sufficient detail. And that from that single hadith, you could learn all of your aqidah more or less. And that is how great this hadith is. One of the things that we learn from this hadith is that our Prophet ﷺ mentioned to us the pillars of Iman, the pillars of faith. And he said that they were six. And tu'mina billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusulih wal yawmi al-akhir wa bil qadari khayrihi wa sharrih. That you believe in Allah, you believe in His angels, you believe in His books and in His messengers, you believe in the last day. And you believe in the qadr, in the decree, the predestiny, the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the good of it and the bad of it. Jibreel alayhi salam, when he had this response from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and Jibreel alayhi salam doesn't need to learn this information, doesn't need to know this stuff. He doesn't need to believe in all of these aspects because he's not mukallaf. He already believes in all of this. He already is someone who worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the point of this hadith and the benefit of this hadith is for me and you. For the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ. This is our aqidah that we need to learn. From these six pillars of Iman that Jibreel ﷺ heard from the Prophet ﷺ. There is only one that he asked concerning it more detail. Only one that he wanted more detail concerning. And it wasn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wasn't the angels or the books or the prophets and it wasn't decree it was the last day and he asked the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam concerning an element of the last day and that is the signs that lead up to the hour to yawm al qiyamah and so he asked the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for those signs why am I mentioning this? Why is this so significant and important? Why is it that Jibreel alayhi salam, from all of those six pillars, he chose that single one, and that is the pillar of the last day. It is to show us the significance of that day, the importance of that day. And that's why often throughout the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam would say, مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ Whosoever believes in Allah and the last day, then let him do such and such. Like the famous hadith, whosoever believes in Allah and the last day, then let him speak good or remain silent. And there are many, many ahadith that speak and mention these two same pillars of Iman. The scholars of Islam say, why? Why doesn't the Prophet ﷺ say, whosoever believes in Allah and the angels, then let him do such and such. Whosoever believes in Allah and the books of Allah, let him do such and such. Whosoever believes in Allah and his messengers or the decree of Allah, let him do such and such. Why is it always Allah and the last day? And the other four pillars of Iman are never mentioned. And the scholars in response say to that, 
Because all of the other pillars of Iman go back to these two. They go back to these two. These are the most essential pillars of Iman. The books of Allah, the angels of Allah, the messengers of Allah, the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they all return to these two pillars. All of them belong to Allah. The angels are a creation of Allah. The messengers are sent by Allah. The books are the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The decree of Allah is his decree. No one else's. It all goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the angels have certain things that they do for Yawmul Qiyamah. And the messengers of Allah all came with that same morning of Yawmul Qiyamah. And the divine revelation all speaks about Yawmul Qiyamah. And the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will inevitably take us to Yawmul Qiyamah. All of those pillars go back to these two. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam would emphasize them so much. And why Jibreel alayhi salam emphasized the single pillar of the last day by asking about its signs. Now one of the great things about Iman in the in Yawm al-Qiyamah and in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well as the other pillars of faith is that you must have Iman in them because many of those elements are from the unseen. The angels of Allah have an element of the unseen. The messengers of Allah for us, we never saw them. We don't know anything about them first hand in the sense that we never lived during that time. There is an element of the unseen. The books of Allah, the speech of Allah that was given to the past prophets and messengers other than the Quran is again something which we didn't witness in its pristine nature, in its pristine fashion before it was changed and misinterpreted. So again there is an element of the unseen. The decree of Allah, only Allah knows what he has decreed for us in the future. An element of the unseen. Yawmul Qiyamah, when it will take place, how it will take place, the timing, exact timing and so on, this is from the unseen. And that's why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah speaks about the muttaqeen, he speaks about them and he says, الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بالغيب. The first attribute of the pious, of the people of taqwa, is that they believe in the unseen. So we believe in the unseen. And we submit to the unseen that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has knowledge of, that Allah has decreed for us. And from that unseen is Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Allah Azza wa Jal says in many places in the Quran, concerning the hour, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ السَّاعَةِ أَيَّانَ مُرْسَاهَا قُلْ إِنَّمَا عِلْمُهَا عِنْدَ رَبِّي لَا يُجَلِّيهَا لِوَقْتِهَا إِلَّا هُ They ask you concerning the hour, when will its time be? Say that that knowledge is with my Lord alone. He will not give that knowledge to anyone. That is Allah's knowledge. Because we believe in that. It is an element of the unseen that we believe in. So Jibreel alayhi salam, going back to that famous hadith of Umar radiallahu an, he knew that this was an element of the unseen. There are no more books after the Quran. No more messengers or prophets after our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But Yawm al-Qiyamah is something which is to come. Something in the future. So the Prophet ﷺ informed us through this hadith of Jibreel to look out instead for its signs. To know that it is coming soon, it is impending, its time is getting closer and closer. How? Because we see those signs. Now the signs of Yawm Al-Qiyamah, and I know that the topic is the Dajjal. This topic though of the signs of the hour generally is so extensive, it would take me days upon days, weeks upon weeks to go through it in a complete fashion. And normally when you study the signs of the hour, the first thing that you study is the principles of Islam that govern the signs of the hour. And this is something which is very important. Whenever you study a science, you study a topic, always begin with its principles and foundations. Because that will then allow you to understand that topic in the way that it should be understood. In its proper context, through its proper light. And you won't have these misunderstandings which unfortunately many people have about many different aspects of Islam. Including the signs of the hour. And that's why today the Dajjal is something which people have different interpretations for. The Mahdi is something which people have different interpretations for. Ya'juj and Ma'juj is something that people have different interpretations for. Why? Because they haven't studied the principles that we derive from the Qur'an and the Sunnah of our Prophet ﷺ and the understanding of the scholars of Islam, those principles that we derive for them that govern our understanding. I don't have time unfortunately though to go through all of that. But that's something which I wanted to preface this lecture with. Just so that it is something which is clear. 
Because I will go through this lecture and I know at the end, because I've done this lecture, alhamdulillah, many times, I know at the end there will be many questions concerning the Dajjal. Many aspects that we won't understand, that didn't quite make sense to us, that we can't really comprehend. And so that's because we haven't studied these principles. And so we're asking these questions. And the answer to many of those questions is often, we don't know. We don't know. And that's why one of the most important principles that govern these types of sciences and these types of topic, topics is that we take our knowledge from authentic sources. And we confine ourselves to that knowledge. And we don't go beyond that knowledge in assumptions, in trying to make stuff up, trying to fill in the gaps, trying to just go and make the story more sensational. It is what it is. We only know what is authentically reported to us in the Quran and the Sunnah of our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned many, many signs. There are hundreds of signs concerning the sign, uh, concerning Yom al Qiyamah, and those are split, generally speaking, into two categories: the minor and the major. The minor and the major. Now, the exact definition of minor and major. And the exact categorization of what falls into minor and major is something which the scholars of Islam have differed over. But generally speaking, the minor signs are those that precede before the major signs. So the minor signs are those which come before the major signs. And most of them will come a specific or a certain period of time, a significant period of time before Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And they will continue to take place up until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So it is not just that once the minor signs have all finished, then the major signs come. No. The vast majority of minor signs will come, then the major signs will begin, and some of the minor signs will still continue to appear during that time that the major signs also come about. And so again, it is something which requires time to understand the categorization and so on. And unfortunately, again, we don't have time uh, to go through this in detail. But just so that you know that there are minor signs and there are major signs. What are the major signs? Again, this is something which the scholars differed over concerning its exact definition. But the majority or many of the scholars uh, took the, the major signs to be ten. And they are the ten that are mentioned by the Prophet ﷺ when he said, count ten things before the signs of the hour. Count ten things before the signs of the hour. And those ten taken from that single hadith that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, those ten, the scholars say, are the major signs of Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Some of the scholars differ, they add stuff, subtract stuff, amend stuff, but generally speaking, many of the scholars are of the opinion that it is those ten signs that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned explicitly. Now we're only going to deal with one of them, and that is the Dajjal. So that's one. I've given you one. Does anyone know what the other nine are? Can anyone tell me? What are the other nine major signs of Yom Al Qiyamah? Brother? Okay, the sun rising from the west, that's one. The smoke, that's another. Yeah, Ajuj and Ma'ajuj. Four, six left. The descent of Isa alayhi salam, that's five. No, not the Mahdi. Although there is a difference of opinion as to whether it is minor or major. The three earthquakes or landslides, the three khusuf, so that's, uh, you count them as three, so that's eight. Two left. The beast. The beast. Or Dabba. And the tenth is? The brother, you said them? Not the wind, no. The fire. The great fire that won't take the people to the land of gathering. So those are the ten major signs. And the minor signs, there are many of them. The first of the minor signs that ever came about was uh, the bi'tha or the coming of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam being sent was the first minor sign. And his death was also a minor sign. And then they continue from that time until our time today. And they will continue until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills. The point is that those are the ten major signs. There is overlap between them. So it's not the case that one has to finish for the next one to start. There can well be overlap as we will see in the story of the Dajjal. Going into the story of the Dajjal. 
from what we know from the sunnah of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because the Dajjal is not mentioned in the Quran. It is not something which Allah Azza wa Jal has discussed in the Quran either by name or by reference. But rather it is something which is detailed in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke extensively about the Dajjal. In fact, if you were to look at all of the major signs of Yawm Al-Qiyamah and even the minor signs, you will find that the one, the single one that probably has the most detail concerning it, that we know most about it authentically, is the Dajjal. And the Prophet ﷺ said in what is authentically uh, attributed to him, he said ﷺ that there has not come a sign from the time of Adam ﷺ until Yawm Al-Qiyamah a trial or a fitna which is greater than the trial of the Dajjal. So from Adam alayhi salam until Yawmul Qiyamah, there has not been a trial which is greater than the trial of the Dajjal. In another hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that every single Prophet of Allah who came warned their nation about the Dajjal. They warned their nations about the Dajjal. And I too, meaning the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, I too warn my nation about the Dajjal. And I will give you more information that, than those prophets had. Know that he is one-eyed and your Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not one-eyed. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam just in these two hadiths has mentioned to us that the Dajjal is the greatest fitna ever to come and also that it is something which all of the prophets of Allah warned against. They warned their people against the coming of the Dajjal. The Dajjal means linguistically someone that's a liar. And he's known as al Masih al-Dajjal, the false messiah. Why? Because his call will be, simply, simply put, that he is Allah. That he is God, that he is the Lord of the heavens and the earth. That will be his call. And that is why he is known as the false messiah, al Masih al-Dajjal. He will call people to his own worship. That he should be worshipped. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, concerning the situation in which he will come about, what will happen, what will the environment, the time, the type of people be during the coming of the Dajjal or just before he arrives. The Prophet ﷺ said that from the signs that the Dajjal will come, is that the people will forget about him. They will become negligent of the Dajjal. And the Imams will forget to speak about him from the pulpits of the masajid, from the manabir, from the minbar. So basically the people generally will be in a state of ignorance concerning the Dajjal. They will know the term Dajjal, they will be familiar of a concept known as the Dajjal, but they will have rarely much information about the Dajjal. They won't have much information about the Dajjal, to the extent that even the Imams in the masjids, in their Friday khutbas, and from their minbars, and from their pulpits, and during their lectures will neglect to speak, about the Dajjal. That is from the signs of Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And that's why you find today, unfortunately, many Muslims are familiar with this concept of the Dajjal, but we know very little about the Dajjal. We actually have very little knowledge actually about the Dajjal, even though we're familiar with the term. And rarely will you go into a masjid or a khutbah, sit during a khutbah, where you will hear about the Dajjal as well. And that is from the signs of the coming of the Dajjal. And the Prophet ﷺ gave us so much information. He gave us so much knowledge about the Dajjal so that we can prepare ourselves. We know that the Dajjal will come and this is how he will be so we can safeguard ourselves from his trials. But this is from the fitan of that time, from the trials of that time. And it is also attributed to a minor sign which we see today and which we will continue to see until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And that is the lack of knowledge amongst the Muslim Ummah. That Allah will raise knowledge. He will lift knowledge. So even though it's there in books, you can read about it, it's there in books, the hadith, Bukhari, Muslim, all of these books are available. Even though the knowledge is there, it is lifted from the hearts of the people. The people don't know this knowledge, even though it is in their books. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said concerning the signs of Yawm Al-Qiyamah from the minor signs, is that the people will be literate. Because if you go back in time, during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, most people were illiterate, couldn't read, couldn't write, unless they had the financial means and capability to learn. It was for the upper class. But even if you go back in England 100, 200 years ago, the vast majority of people didn't go to school, couldn't afford education, couldn't read, couldn't write. 
Many of our parents probably that came from Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, they can't read and write. Our grandparents couldn't read and write. But from the signs of Yawm Al-Qiyamah is that people will become literate. They can read and write. They become educated. They will know. They will become cultured. They will cultivate these skills. But even so, even though the literacy is increasing, the knowledge of Islam decreases. And so we have the ability to learn, but we don't learn. Whereas in the past, they didn't have those means openly available to them to learn and seek knowledge. Yet you had the likes of Imam Abu Hanifa and Malik and Shafi and Ahmad and all of those great scholars, rahimahumullah ta'ala. And so that will be a sign of the coming of the Dajjal. The Prophet wasallam said concerning the situation of that people, of those people before the time of the Dajjal, that Allah will decree that three years before the Dajjal comes, a third of the rain will stop that will normally come down from the heavens. And a third of the vegetation and produce of the earth will stop as well. And then two years before the Dajjal comes, two thirds of the rain will stop. And two thirds of the vegetation and produce will stop. And a year before the Dajjal comes, there will be no rain. And there will be no vegetation upon the earth. Now the scholars differ concerning the exact meaning of this. Is it literally that not a single drop will come? Or that there will be rain? But that rain will have very little blessing in it. There will be very little benefit from that rain. Either way, this, is, this will be the situation of the people. It will be a time of difficulty, time of hardship, time of drought and famine. And the people will be rationing their food. They will be saving it in their stores because the times are hard. That is when Allah Azza wa Jal will decree that the Dajjal will come. The Dajjal has been described extensively by our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is what I mean by the amount of detail that the Prophet ﷺ went into. He described him as exa exactly. He told us what would happen before he came. He told us the powers he will have. He told us from where he will emerge. He told us all of the things that he will do, even the way that he will die. Yet most of us don't know. And that again shows, and this is the qadr of Allah, it is the decree of Allah. Allah has decreed these things to happen because this is how Yawm Al-Qiyamah will come about. May Allah Azza wa Jal safeguard us from these trials. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said concerning his description, that he will be a man, he is from the children of Adam, he is a human, he is a man, and he will have extremely curly hair. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam described his hair like the heads of uh, shayateen, the heads of devils. His curly locks will be like the heads of devils. And the Prophet wasallam said that he will be a man who will have a wide stance. Meaning that he won't stand like you normally stand when you stand up. But he will have a wide stance. And so he won't be able to bring his feet together or his, his knees together. He will have an abnormal stance. And the Prophet wasallam said he will be infertile. Won't be able to have any children. But he will be extremely muscular. And he will have a prominent forehead, and a big head, a prominent forehead, and a big head, and a large body. And the Prophet ﷺ described his head as sitting on his shoulders. And the best example that I can give of this, just so that you can understand what we're saying, is that if you see someone that's extremely pumped up, someone that's doing a lot of steroids probably, someone that's like doing a lot of body weights, you find that their shoulders are so big, their body is so big, it looks like they have no neck, that their head is literally sitting on their shoulders. This is how the Prophet ﷺ described the Dajjal. He will have that type of stature and that type of body build. The Prophet ﷺ said that he will be one-eyed. He will be one-eyed. So his right eye he will be blind from. He cannot see. And the Prophet ﷺ described that he will protrude. His eye will protrude like a grape. That's how he described it. And his left eye that he can see through will not be clear. But he will have a film over it. So he won't be able to see clearly. It won't be like uh, our eyes. But it will be an eye which has a film over it. And some of the scholars I saw, uh, the way that they describe this film is like if you take a grape and you take off the skin from that grape, it is like that. So you can see through the skin of the grape, but it is opaque. It's not transparent. You can't see clearly. It is slightly distorted. And so he will have a film either way, like whatever it is, but it will be a film over his left eye. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, Know that your Lord is not one-eyed, and the Dajjal is one-eyed. And he will have written between his, on his forehead, between his two eyes, three letters. Ka-fa-ra. 
which means disbeliever, disbelief, kafara. And he and this will be read by every single Muslim, whether literate or illiterate. Whether they can read or write or not, educated or not, they will be able to read and recognize these three letters. This is how clearly Allah Azza wa Jal will make clear to the people that he is the Dajjal. And how clearly the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam described him. Yet even so, even so because of the fitan, because of the trials and the powers that he will have, the trials that he will bring, the vast majority of people will follow him. And they will disobey Allah and disbelieve in Allah. And that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that if the Dajjal ever comes out amongst you, then don't go out and seek him. For by Allah a person will go thinking that they are strong in Iman and they will return a disbeliever. That is how strong his trials are, how, how impressive he will be, how strongly he will influence people. That a person will go thinking they have Iman, they have knowledge, they have Islam, they know their religion and they will go and they will come back as a disbeliever. And the Prophet said that a person during that time will tie up his family to the pillars of the house out of fear that they will go and seek out the Dajjal out of curiosity. So a person to this extent, they will fear uh, their family being entrapped and entranced by the Dajjal. So the Prophet described him. The Prophet said that he will emerge from Asbahan, this place which is in modern day Iran, that area. Azerbaijan, that area of the world. And he will appear there and immediately 70,000 people will follow him. Just by him appearing, he will have 70,000 followers immediately. This will form his army. 70,000 people immediately will follow him. And then from there he will go and he will spread around the world. And he will travel like the Prophet ﷺ said so fast that it will be like wind-driven rain. If you had rain coming from a cloud and a strong wind pushing it, that's how fast he will travel. And he will travel all of the earth with the exception of two places, Mecca and Medina. Those will be the only two places safeguarded from the Dajjal. But everywhere else he will go and he will travel. And the Prophet ﷺ said concerning his stay upon earth that it will be 40 days. 40 days will be his kingdom. The first day will be the length of a year. The second day will be the length of a month. The third day will be the length of the week. And the remaining days will be the normal days. And what's amazing is that when the companions radiallahu anhum heard this hadith, they didn't say this, this long period of stay that the Dajjal will have. They didn't ask about military tactics. They didn't ask about weaponry. They didn't say, O oh, Messenger of Allah, what do you advise? How do we overcome him? How do we fight him? What shall we do? What kind of fortress shall we build? How shall we defend ourselves? They said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, how shall we pray on those days? How shall we pray during those days? How amazing were the companions, radiallahu anhum? How strong was their iman? How closely were they attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? doesn't matter how long the Dajjal is here for, what he will bring, what he will do. The only salvation that we have is by returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By having strong iman. If you don't have that, doesn't matter what weapon you have, what other things you have, how educated you are, how knowledgeable you may think you are, none of that will benefit. The only people who will be safeguarded from the trials of the Dajjal are those that Allah safeguards. Those that Allah makes firm upon their religion and on their iman. And so the Prophet wasallam told us and told the companions when they said, how do we pray on those days? He said, estimate. Meaning on that day that is the length of the year, don't just pray five times, but estimate the prayer of a year. Estimate the prayer of a month. Estimate the prayer of a week. And so the Prophet wasallam gave us this valuable advice. The Prophet wasallam said concerning his powers and what he will do during those 40 days, that he will travel like wind-driven rain, and he will go across a group of people, and he will say to them, believe in me for I am your Lord. And the people will, will reject him. They will say, no, we don't believe in you. You're not our God, you're not our Lord. And he will leave them and he won't do anything. But as he leaves them, all of the rations and food that they had in their stores, all of it will be destroyed. All of it will be destroyed. And these are all powers that Allah Azza wa Jal has given to the Dajjal so that he can try and test the people. The Dajjal will go across another group of people and he will say to them, believe in me, I am your Lord. And they will accept and they will believe in him. 
And so he will point to the heavens and he will say, bring forth your rain. And he will point to the ground and he will say, bring forth your vegetation. And the rain will come and the vegetation will come forth from the earth. And he will say to those people, this is for you. He will go to another group of people, a third group. And when they believe in him, he will point to the earth and he will say, Akhriji kunuzuki. Bring forth your treasures. And the earth will give its gold and its silver and its gems and all of the minerals, the natural wealth that it has, will come forth for those people. In some narrations about which the scholars dispute whether it's authentic or not, but in some narrations it is even said that he will have with him a mountain of bread and meat. And he will say to the people who believe in him, take as much as you want, because people will be in a time of hunger and famine and drought. And so bread and meat will be extremely precious, valuable to them. And he will give them from that food. As much as they want, they can take. And so this is how he will go across the earth. The Prophet ﷺ said that he will have two rivers with him. A river of water that seems to be clear, cool water. And a river that apparently seems to be molten lava, fire. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, no, that in reality his water is fire and his fire is water. So if any of you ever have to choose between the two, then choose the fire. That is the type of trials he will bring. And that is how strong your iman must be. That in that choice, even though it goes against all of your natural inklings, your, your natural instincts, you follow the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam and you choose the fire. That is the type of trials that he will bring. The Prophet wasallam told us in another hadith, that a group of people, he will go to a person and he will say to that person, believe in me for I am your Lord. And that person will say, no, I don't believe in you. And so then he will say, what if I bring your parents back to life and they tell you that I am your Lord, will you not then believe? And the man will say, yes. And so he will order two jinn to come in the, in the appearance, in the form of their deceased parents. And they will come and they will say, believe in him, O oh my child, for he is your Lord. And that person will believe. These are the types of trials that he will bring. And he will go and he will conquer every land. And he will kill the people and he will oppress them. And he will do injustice towards those people who refuse to accept him. And he will conquer the earth within that 40 day period. Until he will come to Mecca and Medina. And both of those places he will be unable to enter into. He will try to enter into them but he will find that there are angels standing at the gates of Mecca and Medina with swords that are brandished, holding swords and they are warding off the Dajjal. So when he comes to Medina and he finds that he can't go into Medina, outside of Medina he will strike the earth three times, strike it with three blows. And from the earthquake, from those strikes, three earthquakes will emanate. And with those earthquakes, the Prophet ﷺ said, every hypocrite and disbeliever will come out of Medina. They will be expelled from Medina. So only the true believers in Allah, only the mu'mineen, will remain in these places of Mecca and Medina. And then in one narration, the Prophet ﷺ said that he will go and he will climb one of the mountains near Medina. And he will look down upon Medina and he will see the mosque of the Prophet ﷺ, Masjid al-Nabawi. And he will say, that is the white palace of Muhammad ﷺ. And that's where he will encamp himself. He will be encamped in Medina, near Medina, outside on the outskirts of Medina. And it was during that time that our Prophet ﷺ said that a man from Medina will come, a young man, and he will come and he will seek the Dajjal. And so he will be taken by the army of the Dajjal to see the Dajjal. And he will say to the Dajjal in front of all of these people that have gathered around them, that I know that you are the one that our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam warned us of, meaning you are al Masih al-Dajjal. So the Dajjal will take his sword and he will cut him into two, slice him in half, and the two parts of his body will fall. And he will walk between his body parts, and then he will walk back, and then he will say to the man, Qum, and he will stand. Stand, and the man will stand alive again. And then he will say to him, Now do you believe in me? And the man will reply, Mazdat fika illa basira. I have only increased in my knowledge of you that you are definitely the Dajjal. And so when the people see this, the Dajjal will become extremely angry. And he will take him and lie him down and he will try to cut off his neck, try to kill him. 
But the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah will turn his neck into brass copper, brass or copper, and every time the Dajjal strikes his neck, his sword will bounce off, won't be able to kill him. And now the people are witnessing this, so the Dajjal is becoming even more angry. The fact that this man keeps defying him over and over again. So then he will just take him and he will throw him into that river of fire, which in reality is cool water. And the Prophet ﷺ said concerning this man, هذا أعظم الناس شهادة عند رب العالمين. This man will be the greatest martyr in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa taala. And so it will be after this period, and during this period, by the way, the Mahdi will have already appeared. The Mahdi comes before the Dajjal, and the remaining Muslim army will be in Al Quds, the area of Jerusalem, and the and the Dajjal will leave Medina and he will go to that area in order to fight them. And the Muslims will be surrounded in a fortress, and the Dajjal and his army will be laying siege to that fortress. And it is at that time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will decree that Isa alayhi salam descends. And as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, he will descend by the white minaret in Damascus. Modern day Syria, may Allah azza wa jal make the affairs of those people easy. And so that's when he will descend, and from there he will come to Jerusalem or the area of Al Quds, and by that time, by the time he comes, the Muslims will be about to pray Fajr. It will be the morning, and they will be about to pray Fajr. And so the the Mahdi about to lead the people in Fajr will see Isa alayhi salam, and he will ask him to lead them in prayer. But Isa alayhi salam will refuse, and he will say, "This is an honor which is reserved for your Ummah." And so then. The Mahdi will lead Fajr, and after Fajr, the army of the Dajjal will enter the fortress, they will breach its walls, and then there will be a great battle. And it is at that time when the Dajjal enters, he will see Isa alayhi salam. And immediately upon seeing Isa alayhi salam, all of his strength and all of his powers and all of these abilities that he had that Allah gave him, all of them will begin to vanish, begin to disappear, and he will begin to disintegrate. And the Prophet ﷺ described this and he said, he will, uh, he will dissolve like salt dissolves in water. So when you put water, salt in water, how quickly does it dissolve? After a second or two, you barely see or recognize the salt within that water. That is how quickly he will lose all of these abilities and all of his strength when he sees Isa alayhi salam. And when he sees him, he will know that he, his end is near. So he will run and he will flee. Leave his army, leave the battle, he will run. And Isa alayhi salam will chase him and he will kill him. And after that, the Muslims will be victorious uh, within that battle. So the Prophet, and that is basically a brief uh, summary of the story of the Dajjal, and I've obviously summarized it uh, for the purposes of time. And there is much more detail that can be said concerning the Dajjal, and a lot more study that can go into it. But a couple of important points concerning what we can do about the Dajjal, what we do uh, in order to safeguard ourselves from the Dajjal. Number one, as we mentioned during the lecture, and the most important thing is our knowledge of Islam and our Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the two go side by side. They are interconnected and interlinked. Our knowledge of Islam, that we learn about these issues of the Dajjal, and we teach our families and we teach our children, we prepare ourselves and we prepare our families. And alongside that, one of the best preparations that we can do is by increasing our Iman. And that's why the companions radiallahu anhum, when they would hear things about the Dajjal and these types of issues, the only concern that they had was their Iman. How would they pray? How would they be able to worship Allah? How can they stay strong in Iman during those days? And that is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam also focused on. In these stories of the Dajjal and Ya'juj and Ma'juj and so on, the Prophet ﷺ doesn't tell us what type of tactics to use, where to go and hide, what to do, A, B, C, D. He doesn't mention any of that. It's about Iman, about Ibadah, about, about going back and returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and making your Iman strong. So that's the first point. The second point is as the Prophet ﷺ said to recite Surah Al-Kahf, and to memorize its opening verses. The first 10 verses in one narration, in another narration, the last 10 verses. The Prophet said, من حفظ أول عشر آيات من سورة الكهف عصم من فتنة الدجال Whosoever memorizes the first 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf will be saved from the trials of the Dajjal. Why? Because Surah Al-Kahf deals with the trials of the Dajjal. 
And any of you that have attended, for example, Sheikh Adnan Abdul Qadir, he did a number of lectures at uh, Greenland Masjid concerning this, which were very insightful and very beneficial, mashallah. But it shows a strong link between Surah Al Kahf and the trials of the Dajjal, even though the Dajjal is not mentioned within the Quran, let alone Surah Al Kahf. But from uh, what the Prophet ﷺ has said and from what the scholars have deduced, you can see the links between the two. So that is the second point. The third point is a dua that our Prophet ﷺ taught us. And he taught us to make it in our tashahud. And the companions would say that the Prophet ﷺ would teach us this dua just as he would teach us the surah of the Quran. And that is the dua that you make in your final tashahud. After you send salutations upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that you say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min athabi jahannam, wa min athabi al-qabr, wa min fitnat al-mahya wa al-mamat, wa min fitnat al-masih al-dajjal. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from the punishment of the grave, and the punishment of the fire of hell, and from the trials of living and dying, and from the trials of the dajjal. And that is something which will safeguard you by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the dajjal. So these are some of the things which our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam mentioned to us concerning the Dajjal and how we safeguard ourselves from the Dajjal. And as I said, the most important of these is to strengthen our Iman and increase our knowledge of Islam. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He safeguards us from every type of trial and that Allah azza wa jal makes us firm and strong in our Iman, increases us in our knowledge and enables us to implement that knowledge correctly as well. Hada wallahu a'lam wa nisbatu al-ilmi ilayhi aslam wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Jazakallahu khairan, Brother Ahsan, for that, for that lecture on the Jal. Um, hopefully you'll go through some more with us in, uh, in the future lectures, inshallah. Questions, I'm sure there's many, so uh, I won't stop the lecture here just yet. Hands up for questions. Must have been very comprehensive. Alhamdulillah. You mentioned uh, about the earthquakes and all the hypocrites leave Medina, Mecca. Does that mean Medina. only the believers Medina. Medina? Does that mean only the believers upon the earth will be in Medina at that time? Or is it a general thing? No, so concerning the earthquakes in uh, Medina, when the Dajjal will strike the earth, the three earthquakes will expel all of the hypocrites from Medina. But that doesn't mean that all of the Mu'mineen are just in Mecca or Medina. As we know that there will be some in Al-Quds and there will be uh, batches here and there in other places as well. And Allah knows best. There are some groups that claim that the Dajjal is all already here. Um, they'll say things like the TV is the Dajjal because it's got one eye and explain things like this. Is this a, a valid assumption or is this valid for them to say that? So one of the things that I um, said at the beginning of the lecture is the principles that govern the science, the science of the science of the hour, and these types of sciences of the unseen. And that's why it's important to study them, because once you study those principles and you understand them in the correct context, you know, you don't jump to these types of conclusions. And so the, the Jal is a reality, it's not a symbolism for something, it's not symbolic, meaning that it's not just a metaphor, so the TV can be a Dajjal and so on. Uh, the Dajjal generally means a liar. So a person can be a liar. They can be a Dajjal, like the Prophet ﷺ said, that between me and Yawm Al-Qiyamah, there will be 30 Dajjalin, Kathabin. 30 false liars, meaning false prophets who will come between his time and Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So the word Dajjal can be used in its linguistic sense. But in its technical sense, as the Dajjal, as an entity, that is not symbolic, but it is reality. It is an actual person that will come and he will do all of these things. It is not just a symbol for a TV or for a country or for a type of bank or whatever else uh, a person may attribute to it. And the Prophet ﷺ himself didn't know, uh, but he confirmed that it would be a person, but even the Prophet ﷺ didn't know when the Dajjal would come. He didn't know when the Dajjal would come, whether he arrived or whether he would come during his time or after his time. And that's why there are uh, narrations which I don't want to go into because they're detailed and uh, they would take a lot of time to explain. But there, there are narrations that show that even the Prophet ﷺ didn't know what time the Dajjal would come. 
And so that shows that we never know that that knowledge is only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah knows best. Allahu alam. I don't know. Uh, the hadith don't speak about um, you know his background in terms of his family life or in terms of um, in terms of these types of details. The only narration that I can remember is the hadith of Aisha radiyallahu anha, in which the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that he will um, that his appearance will be preceded by extreme anger, that he will become extremely angry before he appears. What that means, how is that, what does that signify, what type of anger, when, how this will happen, that's not mentioned in any authentic narration. And Allah knows best. One of the narrations about the signs of the hour is that um, a bow-legged Ethiopian will take down the Kaaba. Will that be after the Dajjal or before? So with regards to, um, as I said before, during the major signs of the hour, some minor signs will still continue to appear. Uh, but the Prophet wasallam said in an authentic hadith that after the Dajjal, we know that Ya'juj and Ma'juj will be, well, the descent of Isa will happen, then Ya'juj and Ma'juj will happen. And the Prophet wasallam said in an authentic hadith that after Ya'juj and Ma'juj, the people will go to make Hajj, meaning that there will still be Hajj. So therefore, uh, the hadith of the destruction of the Kaaba and its dismantling, uh, therefore seems to be after this period. The Prophet said there will be Hajj after Ya'juj and Ma'juj, and that means there must be a Kaaba for the people to go and make Hajj, and then it will be after this that the dismantling of the Kaaba will take place, and Allah knows best. What about the Hadith you mentioned, he's a chain Yeah, that's the Hadith I was trying to avoid mentioning. Uh, that Hadith is in Sahih Muslim, the Hadith of Fatima bin Qais radiallahu anha, that she narrates from. Tamim al-Dari radiyallahu anhu was a Christian man and he went on an expedition and he saw what he described as a beast and he came back and he described it and the Prophet ﷺ said that is the Dajjal and so on. The scholars of Islam uh, differ over its exact meaning. Some of them said that it is weak in its method. So even though it's authentic in this chain of narration, it's in Sahih Muslim, they said that it's weak in its method. That there is nakara, there is some um, fallacies within its actual story and so some said it's weak others said it is authentic but then there is a large discussion over this that I uh, I don't have the time to go into and this isn't the place to go into it either any other questions mm-hmm.